Okay, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, on this uh, special occasion. Um, the title has been read out already. Uh, let me start by wishing uh, Sriram a happy birthday and, and also to express my appreciation for your pioneering contributions, <coughs> setting very high standards uh, for the rest of us to aim for in research and uh, for the inspiration. Uh, many happy returns. Um, okay, so here's a, a, an outline of the talk that I'm going to give. Um, so I'm going to uh, say a little bit about, uh, by way of motivation and introduction, about dense active matter. Um, <clears throat> and and <clears throat> in particular, the transition between arrested and flowing states uh, in biological context and models thereof. Um, and, and I'm going to say then um, uh, something about the analogy between active driving and driving by shear deformation that has been recently discussed in literature. And, um, <coughs> and, and the sort of the main point of my talk is going to be that uh, under active dynamics, you have a, a transition from rigid to <coughs> fluidized states of amorphous uh, packings of matter that look very much like the yielding transition, and, and uh, uh, in, in particular under cyclic shear deformation. Uh, so in order to make that point, first I'll tell you uh, a little bit about yielding under cyclic shear deformation, and then I'll show you the corresponding results uh, for uh, active amorphous solids, um, and a particular uh, detail that I will also then discuss is the role of confinement and, and persistent times in uh, determining this transition, the location of this transition. This work has been largely done by Yagi Goswami, who is a PhD student with me at JNC. Currently, he's a postdoc uh, at PSI in Switzerland with Shiv Shankar. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, this audience doesn't need me to go through any of these points, and, and, uh, uh, but just to sort of get, uh, get going and place the, uh, uh, the, the work that I'm going to present in context, uh, let me say a few things. Um, so um, active matter is something that's been studied uh, intensely over uh, the last decade or so. Uh, and among the motivations uh, to, to, to do this is uh, that it seems to be a good description uh, of a variety of uh, biological systems uh, across different length scales. And uh, several of these examples include, uh, involve uh, dense assemblies of uh, matter, uh, leading to an interesting interplay between glassy or jamming uh, physics and, and that of active dynamics. And uh, therefore, in particular, transitions between rigid and flowing uh, uh, regimes uh, in, in, the, in the dynamics of these systems is, is of interest. Um, and um, so the investigation of models of such dense active matter, therefore, uh, can be and have provided useful perspectives on dense biological assemblies. Here is one example uh, from the work of uh, Max B. et al., uh, Christina included. Um, which discussed the transitions from <coughs> uh, solid to fluid states in, in, in a model of confluent tissue. Um, <coughs> and uh, now, uh, <coughs> looking at active glasses has also been pursued by several colleagues who are in the room. Uh, Sarod, Gaut, um, Madan, Chandan, is still there, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and basically here, uh, these were particulate assemblies of, of, uh, uh, which, which, which were, uh, of, made up of particles that were subject to active forces. And, uh, and these have been investigated with temperature, the strength, and persistence of the active forces as control parameters. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one observes, or uh, these, these colleagues have presented results. Uh, uh, to indicate a transition to structurally arrested states with decreasing temperature and an active force. 
and uh, also identify an, uh, an interesting uh, regime of intermittent dynamics with that, yeah, uh, with, with novel heterogeneities and, and so on. Okay, so the immediate sort of uh, context for, for, for me uh, to, to get interested in looking at this um, has been some work on, on the spatial organization of uh, chromosomes uh, that has been studied uh, by uh, the group of uh, Shivashankar. And uh, so the, the few uh, key points that are of relevance to this talk are, are listed here. Um, so chromosome sp spatial organization and dynamics is correlated with the cell state. Uh, differentiated uh, cell state show arrested chromosome positions with geometry-dependent arrangements, whereas undifferentiated uh, states are more dynamic. Um, and one can go from this differentiated to de-differentiated states. And uh, uh, this is sort of the work that uh, uh, Shiva and, and his lab have focused on. Uh, by changes in mechanical environment of cells uh, through changes in confinement, OK? Uh, and and de-differentiation is marked by fluidization of the chromatin. So this is, these are uh, uh, some key features of, of uh, <coughs> the, this phenomenology. And uh, so the main point for, for us to sort of take from this is that confinement and boundary interactions are an additional interesting parameter in determining uh, <coughs> the transition from rigidity to fluidization uh, <coughs> in dense assemblies of active particles. And uh, so... That's sort of, uh, in addition, that is to the, the strength of the active force and, 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 the, uh, and, and the persistence of these active forces. Uh, so with that in mind, we investigate the transition from rigid to fluidized states in dense particle assemblies subjected to active dynamics, including the confinement states uh, as a relevant parameter. <coughs> OK, so this is what we want to study. And, and uh, I already mentioned some work that has been done. Um, but uh, a perspective that's particularly relevant uh, for what I'm going to tell you uh, is an analogy between, uh, that has been sort of discussed, uh, between active driving and driving induced by shear deformation. And this is sort of illustrated here in this picture from uh, the paper here uh, by Morse et al. Uh, so the basic idea is that there is a certain displacement field uh, that, that corresponds to uh, shear deformation. And, and <clears throat> when one is looking at active dynamics, actually these, these colleagues uh, look in particular at what they call active random displacement. So it's, it's sort of the strain version of active uh, forces, sorry. Um, uh, so uh, here, so the idea is that if I have basically displacements along some random vector in uh, configuration space, uh, this, is, this bears an analogy with doing so along a particular displacement uh, vector that is defined by a shear strain step, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, and this discussion uh, was, was in the context of infinite persistence times. Uh, but for many examples of interest, we would be interested in looking at finite persistence times. And uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And the summary uh, of, of uh, our observations is that for finite persistence times, active fluidization exhibits behavior that has striking analogies with yielding under cyclic shear deformation. So this was, um, <clears throat> and these include uh, driving induced annealing of the amorphous solids that we're going to look at, and a striking dependence of the yielding transition on the degree of annealing of the amorphous solids. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so that's sort of what I'm going to tell you about uh, active amorphous solids, but in order to sort of set, set the stage, let me take a few minutes and tell you about uh, plasticity and yielding of amorphous solids under uh, shear deformation, and uh, under shear deformation, amorphous solids exhibit plastic rearrangements that lead to yielding for large enough deformation, 
and this has been investigated in uh, <coughs> uh, many works, both under uniform and cyclic shear, uh, shear. Um, and in computer simulations, typically under athermal quasi-static conditions. And uh, <coughs> if, if one were to take an amorphous solid and apply strain, uh, the behavior of the stress is illustrated here, uh, which is um, <coughs> given by uh, uh, an initial elastic looking branch followed by uh, uh, a series of uh, plastic uh, rearrangements as illustrated in this uh, video clip, uh, which <coughs> correspond to discontinuous changes in stress and energy and so on. And, and, and the statistics of these are of interest in themselves. I won't say more about it uh, in today's talk. <coughs> okay, so here is sort of a quick summary of what we do in this context of, of looking at uh, uh, cyclically sheared amorphous uh, solids. Uh, we look at model glasses, and by glasses we mean local energy minimum configurations that are obtained from liquid configurations equilibrated at different temperatures, Tp. Now, the temperature at which the liquid was equilibrated before subjecting it to a local energy minimization uh, determines the degree of annealing of the glass. So the lower the temperature, the lower the energy of the corresponding glasses that we prepare. And, and uh, this is going to be an important parameter in, in, in determining the behave, yielding behavior that I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> and, and so uh, these glasses, which are prepared at different degrees of annealing, um, are subjected to a thermal quasi-static shear, uh, <clears throat> where um, one relaxes the system to local energy minima after each uh, step in the strain. And um, in, in, in the case of cyclic shear, we basically shear back and forth, and, and the parameter that describes what you're doing is, is the maximum strain that you achieve uh, through each cycle. And uh, such repeated cyclic cycles of shear <coughs> lead to both elastic and plastic responses. And uh, one looks at it typically at the end of each cycle or stroboscopically, okay? So <coughs> if one focuses on the energy of the system, um, <clears throat> uh, the potential energy per particle uh, over each cycle of strain changes and reaches a final value that depends on the strain amplitude, uh, gamma max, as well as the initial energy for small strain amplitudes. I'll, I'll uh, <coughs> illustrate that here, so if I were to start with a glass that has a, an initial energy like so, and I apply a small amplitude of strain, I reach some final energy. If I increase the amplitude of strain, that final energy decreases. And if I increase the strain amplitude further, it decreases further. Um, <clears throat> till some point, um, <clears throat> and for the same set of strain amplitudes, if I were to start with a lower energy, as the initial energy of the glass, uh, then its behavior is very different. The final state that I reach remembers the initial state, okay? In contrast, <clears throat> if I now increase the strain amplitude beyond the values that, that I, I mentioned here, uh, this went up to 7%. Um, <clears throat> the, if I go up to 8%, now the final energy reached doesn't depend on where I start anymore. So there's some form of ergodicity. Um, and unlike these initial set of strain values where with increasing strain, the energy decreased, with increasing strain, the energy now increases, okay? And uh, something that you can also tell from looking at these uh, curves is that the time it takes or the number of cycles it takes to reach the final state is also changing. And, and in particular, if one sort of makes a plot of some uh, estimate of the relaxation times of these curves, uh, the number of cycles to reach the final state, uh, it, it exhibits an apparent divergence at the transition point which we identify with yielding, okay? And um, 
also, um, <clears throat> if one looks at the cycle to cycle evolution of configurations uh, in these systems, uh, below this yielding point, uh, the, the system is non-diffusive. So at the end of each cycle, you come back to a configuration that was close to what you had at the beginning, uh, whereas <coughs> beyond the transition point, the configurations begin to evolve, so you exhibit diffusive motion. Okay, so that's illustrated here, where the mean squared displacements as a function of accumulated strain, which is basically proportional to the number of cycles, uh, exhibits a, a linear slope on the right side of this yielding transition, whereas it's flat on the left side of the transition, okay? So these are sort of characteristics that we're going to focus on, the annealing behavior, the dependence on the initial state of the glass, um, the divergence of time scales, and uh, the transition from non-diffusive to diffusive uh, behavior. So these are hallmarks of yielding under cyclic shear, okay? So, um, and the dependence of the or the dependence of the yielding behavior on the initial annealing, or in simple words, the initial energy of the glass is shown over a much wider uh, range of uh, <coughs> initial conditions here, uh, where basically one sees that across a certain threshold energy, the nature of the yielding transition changes from a, what looks close to a continuous transition to something that looks increasingly more are discontinuous, okay? And this is also reflected in the stress-strain curves. Um, this is also something that we're going to keep in mind, okay? So with, with that in mind, we look at now uh, a system of particles that are subjected to active uh, forces. Uh, in addition to the usual pairwise interactions, one has now this driving force <coughs> uh, along a, a, a uh, 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 direction vector n, uh, and, and this is now the, the Langevin equation that describes uh, the dynamics of, of this system, and uh, <clears throat> the orientation uh, of the active force changes with time, uh, subject to uh, <coughs> uh, a, a noise, uh, a delta correlated noise, uh, so the correlation between the direction vector at time t and t prime uh, is, is, uh, is an exponential decay with a, <coughs> a persistence time that's given by this symbol tau t, okay? Um, okay, so uh, the question we want to answer is uh, what yielding behavior do we see for active glasses with finite persistence times? Um, and does yielding under active forcing with finite persistence map in some fashion to cyclic shear yielding, okay? <clears throat> okay, so um, I won't uh, spend much time on um, going through the system. We look at a two-dimensional system <coughs> like the work of Mondal et al. That, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, we look at a, a system of 1,000 particles, and uh, we consider different glasses which have different energies uh, depending on the liquid, uh, the temperature at which the liquid configurations were equilibrated before the glass was obtained from them through an energy minimization, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is now the energy as a function of the magnitude of the active force uh, that one finds. Um, for a range of the energies of the initial glasses, okay? And uh, what I show here is for the same system, uh, the yielding diagram uh, for a finite shear rate uh, case, not a thermal quasi-static as I mentioned earlier, but at finite shear rates, and, and, and basically uh, <clears throat> the behavior that one sees in all the different respects is, is strikingly similar to what one has under uh, cyclic shear, uh, one has a, a, a strong dependence on the, the, the initial state of the glass uh, of the yielding behavior, and there is uh, 
<clears throat> beyond uh, a certain uh, point, one reaches sort of an asymptotic state, which is uh, indistinguishable for the initial, for, for different initial uh, states of the system. And uh, if one looks at the mean squared displacements uh, for these uh, different cases, uh, as shown here, uh, one finds, this is now for one particular uh, sample, I forget which one, it's not uh, labeled, but as a function of the, the amplitude of the, the, the active force, if one looks at the mean squared displacements, uh, one again finds this discontinuous change from a non-diffusive to a diffusive state, okay? So the aspects of annealing and yielding, uh, as well as the transition from absorbing to diffusive states, uh, in this case, are essentially the same as, as the case of cyclic shear yield. Uh, as a case of cyclic shear. Now the other thing is to look at um, <clears throat> the time scales that one has for reaching the asymptotic steady states. And, and uh, this is now uh, uh, the, the behavior of the energy of the system uh, as a function of time for different driving amplitudes. And clearly from this data you see that uh, as, as I decrease the force, um, uh, the active force amplitude, it takes me longer and longer for this set of data. Uh, some of these data you don't see, uh, they're all hidden under uh, the curves here. Uh, but basically up to magenta, which is 0.8, you see that as I decrease the force amplitude, the time scale to reach the steady state is increasing. And uh, there's a corresponding set of time scales that, that one obtains from looking at not these well annealed glasses, but poorly annealed glasses. Uh, and and um, these are plotted here. And the point simply is that the same kind of apparent divergence of time scales also occurs uh, in this case. Okay. Um, okay, so the summary is there is a strong analogy uh, between fluidization and reactive driving and cyclic shear yielding. And this is, uh, okay, it's a detail. Um, um, one of the things that I had shown you earlier was also the stress-strain curves that show sort of a quasi-elastic branch followed by stress drops and, and, and an approach to the, the, the flowing stress value, the flow stress value here. Um, we don't have, okay, um, <coughs> We compute um, the corresponding quantity uh, by, by looking at uh, the projection of the, the velocity vectors along the driving force, uh, which gives us some estimate of a shear rate. And from that, we obtain the equivalent of a, a, a strain step. And, and we look at the derivative of the change in energy with that strain step to obtain the, the stress value. And the, <clears throat> those active stresses uh, estimated are shown here, uh, which show that there is indeed a change in behavior at the point where you expect, though it's not exactly the same thing, okay? I can discuss this more. And, and we do the, we, we follow the same procedure down here, uh, but for the cyclic shear case, and uh, just to show that uh, the normal virial definition of the, the, the stress, uh, and, and this, the definition that we use here, uh, give us consistent uh, estimates of the stress. Okay, and um, okay, I should be uh, one minute. Okay, that should be good, I think. Um, so <clears throat> this is now just showing quickly that the change in the, the yielding behavior uh, as a function of the, <clears throat> the persistence time. And, and uh, okay, a quick summary is, the point at which yielding occurs moves to larger values uh, as the persistence time increases. And uh, for the different cases that we look at, we again have this, this apparent diverging behavior of time scales across the yielding transition. And the last point is <clears throat> um, how does the confinement geometry affect the transition? One does expect in general that confinement will um, induce uh, some changes in behavior, 
uh, and, and as, a, as a preliminary uh, investigation, we looked at sort of two geometries, one close to circular and the other more uh, ellipsoidal, uh, sorry, elliptical <coughs> two dimension. Um, so what we find is that for this more symmetric geometry, yielding occurs at a smaller value than uh, uh, the more elongated uh, geometry um, where it, it, it happens at higher active forces. Okay, um, and that transition is also associated with uh, a non-diffusive to diffusive transition. Okay, so uh, that's the summary of my talk. I'll leave it out there. Uh, basically, uh, our results show that active dynamics leads to a yielding transition which, is, which bears close analogies uh, to yielding under cyclic shear, okay? Thank you for your attention. Welcome any questions you have. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to know if there are distinctive features of the active yielding as distinct from the oscillatory shear yielding. I mean, you talked a lot about the similarities. You may have said something about the differences. I didn't catch it. So the one big difference, which we don't understand at the moment, huh. is uh, when you look at the stress-strain curves, mm -hmm. um, you don't see the expected dependence on the annealing state of the glass. I see. Right? And, and also, you don't find, you know, like uh, familiar features like stress drops. So this is something that ah, it somehow it's the, 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 the way it's being forced is by sort of random persistent right. moves, right? All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, the, I, I guess you know. Um, um, yeah. Initially, we, given the sort of motivation, we wanted to look at sort of fluidization under. Uh, active forces, and we thought confinement was interesting. Uh, but when we looked at the results, actually, it, it, uh, you, know, one, you know, when you go from a rigid to a fluid state, there, there are many different ways in which you can do it. And, and it's, uh, as far as these results suggest, it's very close to what happens in the cyclic shear. Right. Yeah, you, he had a question. Um, oh. I have a question about the oscillatory shear uh, mm -hmm. dynamics that you showed. So, in the definition of the probe, you don't break time reversal symmetry, meaning that you use a one-dimensional oscillation with basically symmetric uh, 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 sort of forward and backward uh, right. tilt. And then you look for the onset of breaking of time reversal symmetry later on. My question is, what happens if you start to implement it in the beginning? So let's say have a two-dimensional shear protocol in which you go yeah. to the left and a right, and then go to, uh, forward, and then you back, uh, come back from a different trajectory. Yeah. Okay, I, that's so an interesting. Does the answer disappear or not is my question. Mm, I don't know if it has been systematically studied. Um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't expect it to uh, disappear, okay? But uh, certain aspects of the, so what has been looked at is, uh, the, the, some aspects of the mechanical, mechanically induced annealing do change when you when you change the the, the strain protocol. Um, yeah, so uh, see in the um, uh, equilibrium case, uh, when you saw this uh, continuous to discontinuous transition, depending on the initial condition, not only this we do was changing with the jump of this uh, EIS. But also, it was uh, the critical point was shifting uh, in a systematic way. Is it obvious? In, uh, which uh, in, 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 in sorry, where now? Uh, this uh, <coughs> the equilibrium case without activity. Hmm. When you look at the transition uh, ah. the energy, so is it obvious? Or do you, uh, <coughs> well, I mean, it's obvious at the level that uh, a more stable glass will, you may expect, also will have a broader stability range. Subjected to deformation. It's only in the discontinuous regime. So, why is not ah. there in the continuous regime? So that's a, I, I don't know uh, how much time I have Maybe. to answer. For. Yeah. No, that that's a much more interesting question because what happens when you start at high energies is that you actually sort of converge to the same threshold state before you yield, right? 
why that happens, uh, that that's sort of not fully understood. Yeah. Thanks, Shrikant, for a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, uh,